since uh, time began and new innovations hit our lives, there have been two types of people. Those who are focused on safety first and regulation and cry more regulation. And those who think this is the future, please don't spoil it. And I'm thrilled that today we have two people with us who are dedicated to making sure that regulation doesn't spoil it, but supports innovation and encourages it to flourish. I have with me Simon McDougall, the Technology and Innovation Executive Director at the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. You'll see that he is not Elizabeth Denham, who is billed in your, um, in your program. Elizabeth sadly was unwell. I also have Catherine Ross, the newly appointed Chair of the Regulatory Horizons Council. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. When we spoke a few weeks ago, I think you were in your first week on the job, and I bent your arm to come and explain your plans at the Regulatory Horizons Council to our audience at COGX. So I believe you have some slides, and I would absolutely love you to take us through some of those slides, and then I'll come back to you and quiz you with Simon about how we're gonna work together on this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tabitha, for uh, introducing me, and, and thank you very much for having me uh, give the keynote at your afternoon session at the COGX Festival. It's really exciting uh, to be here. Uh, I should say at the outset that Jack uh, is going to be in charge of the slides uh, for me. So you will at various points hear me ask Jack to move the slides on. So Jack, now will be the time to show the first slide, please. Excellent, excellent. Right, we've, we've cracked that. Thank you very much. Um, so as I said, my name is Catherine Ross and I am the chair of a new body called Regulatory Horizon. Council and I'll talk a little bit about uh, why we exist and, and what it is uh, we are trying to do uh, in, in, in a minute, in particular about how we bring together uh, technological innovation and the regulatory landscape in a way that works uh, really well. Uh, but before we get into any of that, uh, I should say uh, at the outset that uh, I don't just want you to sort of sit uh, and listen uh, to what I have to say. Uh, in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, I would really, really welcome your participation. So we're gonna be running a Slido poll uh, during this session. And the question that we would like your views on is what are the top five innovations that will have the biggest economic, social and environmental impact on the UK uh, over the next 10 years? Doesn't matter what it is, uh, doesn't matter if you think it might be a bit uh, you know, a bit far into the future or a bit speculative, just tell us what you think you think um, will have the best, uh, biggest technological uh, impact uh, on the UK uh, in the next 10 years uh, or so. Uh, Jack, I don't know, do we have a link that you can show as to how people can access the poll? No, I'm not sure we do. Anyway, uh, hopefully it will become apparent to you uh, how, how we can run the, the poll uh, during the session, but uh, very, very keen to get your view. So anyway, if we move on to the next slide, please, that will be, that will be great. Okay, so I said we were gonna talk a little bit about technology and regulation and how to marry the two up in order to deliver best value for the UK. That is really the exam question that we at the Regulatory Horizons Council exist uh, to try and shed some light on. Um, and it's, it shouldn't be a very surprising uh, question that we've been asked uh, to answer because we all know uh, how much technology is changing our lives right now. It's enabling innovation in almost literally everything that we do. It's changing how we live, it's changing how we work, uh, it's changing how we interact, how we consume, uh, what we make and how we make it, how we buy things. It's having a huge impact on the entire uh, UK uh, economy and society. And so we do need to think uh, very consciously and very carefully uh, about how technological innovation uh, meets the regulatory landscape to ensure that where technology um, is capable of driving massive benefits, it does so in a way that keeps pace with, uh, doesn't exceed the pace of perceived legitimacy. Uh, so that technology is seen uh, as legitimate and actually doing good uh, in society and in our economy, uh, rather than uh, delivering some of the stuff that people are most concerned uh, about. Um, and we also need to make sure that regulation uh, doesn't unduly get in the way. I mean, regulation is really important in order to uh, protect uh, legitimacy and to make sure uh, that society's concerns are reflected. But it needs to be proportionate. It needs to be effective. 
uh, in conjunction with the technology uh, that we are using uh, and may wish to use uh, in the future. Uh, and so regulation really needs to adapt uh, if we're going to answer this exam question. So let's just unpack the question uh, that I've put on the slide here. How should the regulatory environment change if the UK is to get best value from technological innovation? Well, the first thing to say is we are focusing on the regulatory environment, but we are considering that regulatory environment in a broad sense. So it doesn't just include uh, sectoral regulation or laws or rules. Uh, it also includes things like standards. Uh, it also includes things like guidance. Um, we'll be looking at the substance of regulation, but we'll also be looking at the process by which regulation is created and implemented. And we'll also be looking at how uh, regulation is perceived. So anything to do with the regulatory environment, uh, that is very much in the scope of what we'll be looking at. Uh, obviously, uh, the reason that we exist is to drive change. Uh, change is absolutely at the heart of what we do. We would see ourselves, I think, very much as, if you like, a disruptive element uh, in, in the regulatory system. We are here to provoke, we're here to challenge, we're here to disrupt the status quo. Uh, what will that look like? What well, might look uh, like uh, recommendations for deregulation. Uh, it might look like recommendations for re-regulation so that the substance of regulation remains fit for purpose in the light of technological innovation. Uh, it might actually be recommending new regulation where regulation doesn't exist because there are uh, concerns that need to be addressed as technology develops and, and, and gets taken up. Um, we may be looking at changes to regulatory substance, but we may also look at, at the process uh, as well. But it is all about uh, how regulation needs to change. Um, so what about this question about the UK getting best value from technological innovation? And I think this is a really, really important question for us uh, because it is not just about uh, some of the more obvious aspects of, of, of value. It's not just about making sure that the UK uh, economy remains competitive on the global stage, although it is certainly about that. Uh, it's not just about enabling and driving greater productivity, although it's certainly about that too. It is also more broadly about making sure that we get the benefits from uh, new technology in terms of cleaner environment, uh, more sustainability, uh, more inclusive uh, society, uh, more effective citizenship, and all of those good things as well. So we're taking a broad view uh, of what we mean by, by best value. Um, and then really, when, it, when we talk about technological innovation, I think one of the things that's really important uh, from a regulatory horizons council perspective um, is that we're taking a holistic view uh, of what technological innovation needs to succeed. A lot of regulatory bodies, um, you know, simply because of, of, of what they are and how they've been set up, um, tend to take a look through a particular lens. So maybe if you're a sectoral uh, economic regulator, you look at your sector, uh, but maybe you miss some of the more sort of holistic aspects that fall outside your remit. Um, you know, if, if you have a particular toolkit, you might be looking at how best to apply that toolkit rather than thinking holistically about how to enable a certain technology to succeed. Um, so we are absolutely certainly going to be taking that holistic view. Um, and I think we would see ourselves uh, very much as an organisation that will be following anticipatory uh, regulatory approaches, uh, taking a future back uh, look and thinking uh, about uh, how regulation uh, can enable uh, a vision of the future uh, rather than just uh, solving problems uh, that have existed in the past. So that's very much the exam question uh, that we have been created to answer. And it's, it's, it's worth unpacking that, it's worth understanding really uh, what that means. If you go on to the next slide, um, I'm gonna show you a few things about how we're going to work uh, and what you might see from us, which I think you'll, you'll hopefully see are very much aligned with that exam question that we're trying to solve. Essentially, uh, at our heart, what we're going to be doing is scanning the horizon uh, trying to identify technological innovations that are coming uh, down the pipeline. to understand which of those technological innovations are going to be potentially significant uh, for the UK in terms of uh, driving those kinds of values that I, I spoke about earlier on. And then we'll be trying to, to marry those up and say, well, OK, of those technological innovations that seem like they're coming, they seem like they're going to be significant, which of those are likely to collide with some form of regulation? And it's within that intersection uh, that we may then choose uh, to look and see if we can add some value by recommending uh, some regulatory changes. 
Now, as I said, you know, our intention is to be very technology centric, very sort of future back, uh, very holistic in how we work. And if we're going to get that right, um, we're placing a lot of emphasis on that listening uh, issue, that, that, that listening part uh, of the flowchart that we, we've shown here. Because, you know, we really don't want to just talk to the usual suspects. We don't just want to talk to, you know, big, well-resourced uh, incumbents who have, you know, regulatory affairs uh, departments, who have public affairs departments. We want to talk to academics. We want to talk to entrepreneurs. We want to talk to venture capitalists, people on the ground who are actually involved in creating uh, new technologies and applying new technologies to be innovative. Uh, and we want to understand their experience of how do you get from the idea uh, to something that looks a little bit like a startup business? How do you get that startup business to scale? Uh, and what, what's the regulatory issues uh, that you are engaging with as you go on that journey? And if you ask the question, well, what could you change to make it better? What would you answer? So that conversation uh, with that group of people is really, really critically important. But we also then need to be a bridge into the kinds of people who think more about regulation, possibly because they apply it. So, you know, people in government, people in regulators themselves. Uh, but we also need to talk to civil society bodies, NGOs, to think tanks, uh, the sorts of organizations that might actually raise some concerns about some of this technology. Uh, and so we need to bridge between the people who are trying to get these things off the ground and the people who might be saying, well, hold on a minute, we need to think about X, we need to think about Y. And if we bring those two sides of the conversation together, uh, we should be able to, to, to really add value and convene a very powerful discussion. So, OK, so then the Regulatory Horizons Council is in the middle of a really interesting conversation. Uh, we're talking to lots of people. What will you see us then do? And I think at the heart of the approach that we're going to take uh, it's really a, an iterative uh, approach. So, you know, we intend to put things out there uh, in the form of things like snapshot reports that, for example, you might have seen from, from places like CDEI, uh, blogs, um, you know, Twitter posts, you know, things on LinkedIn, all, all the rest of it. You know, things that, that we can put out there uh, to say, this is what we're hearing. This is what we're thinking. Um, would you like to engage with us? Would you like to tell us whether we're thinking something that, that you don't agree with or it's not your experience? Are we missing the point? So we get this constant iteration uh, between you know, what we're hearing, what we're thinking, and then how other people then want to interact with that and help us to, to refine that. Um, now, at some point, uh, we will be producing uh, some deep dives. So we're going to be looking at uh, as I said, particular technological innovations that we see coming down the pipeline. And we're going to start then uh, to, to really map out where those technological innovations will meet the regulatory environment and start putting out some ideas about how that regulatory environment might change. And then we will iterate those recommendations and then we'll see what people think about those, both in terms of whether they would in fact enable the technology, whether they would continue to protect uh, against legitimate societal concerns, whether they would be proportionate, whether they would be practical, uh, you know, work all of that through in a very sort of participatory way. Um, and then ultimately, as you can see at the bottom of this flowchart, uh, the output that we produce will be recommendations to those who are capable of delivering uh, regulatory change. So it might be recommendations to uh, government uh, about policy, it might be recommendations to regulators, uh, or it might indeed be recommendations to others in, in the landscape, for example, you know, civil society groups or NGOs about how they could play uh, a bigger and better role in order to uh, facilitate uh, more effective uh, regulation. So I hope you can see from what I've said there that, that, you know, that exam question that we've been set up to answer really does flow through uh, all of the different ways that we expect to be working and interacting with actually a very wide and complex uh, group of stakeholders. And I think through all of this, you know, we have to challenge ourselves as the Regulatory Horizons Council to make sure that we are really adding value, you know, that we're really taking that long term approach, that holistic approach, that future back approach uh, that actually regulators find genuinely quite, quite tricky to do. Uh, and that that is not a criticism. Uh, I'm, I've been a regulator uh, myself. Uh, I was regulator for, for, for 20 years or so. I know just how difficult a job it is. Um, and oftentimes, 
you know, the things that you would really like to be talking about are exactly uh, some of the kinds of things that the Regulatory Horizons Council will be looking at. Uh, but it's quite practically quite difficult to do when you have an immense, difficult, complicated, demanding day job. Uh, and so, you know, as the Regulatory Horizons Council, uh, we think we can add value in conjunction with uh, a lot of uh, what regulators and government are already thinking, uh, but we can work with them and we can refine that and we can add some value in a, in a different context. Um, now, if you flip onto the next slide for me, Jack, um, I don't know whether we've managed to, to, to make the poll happen uh, yet, but I was hoping we would uh, hear back from you guys uh, in terms of what you think uh, we should be focusing on. I don't think we've quite managed to do that. Maybe we'll be able to uh, share the poll results with you uh, later on. So if you flip on to the next slide, um, I can share with you our thinking uh, about some of the areas that we might wish to focus on. So you can see what we've been doing here is we've been trying to do some preliminary work uh, about our priorities. And we've been trying to look at uh, different potential applications uh, of, of new technologies in different areas that feel quite important to us in terms of uh, the UK economy and society. And then we've been trying to identify within those different applications, where are there technologies that are coming that look like they have real potential uh, to shake things up and to change things. So you can see there, you know, we, we've identified potential applications in the area of banking, finance and commerce. Uh, obviously, UK is very strong uh, in the fintech space. Uh, we think we have uh, the potential uh, to, to do great things going forward in the fintech space. Um, and, and obviously, one of the things we, we have observed there um, is that there is massive potential from uh, the application of big data and machine learning. So is there something that we could look at uh, there, for example? Uh, we've been looking at construction uh, and manufacturing, um, you know, looking at the potential of new technology to change uh, processes uh, there and also to bring in the use of, of new materials. Um, very interesting uh, area, I think, uh, energy generation and storage, uh, loads of potential uh, technological uh, change in that area with, with some potential massive upside. Um, obviously, we've been looking at entertainment and leisure and media, uh, not least because a lot of what you see uh, in the entertainment and leisure space uh, is actually the forerunner of technologies that then become more widely applicable uh, in the economy uh, beyond just uh, themselves. So that's another area that is interesting for us. Uh, environment and waste, uh, food, water and agriculture. I think there's lots of things in food, water and agriculture, uh, agricultural technology, the use of robotics, uh, the use of blockchain technologies there, the use of robotics. Um, you know, that's an interesting area. We would be entirely remiss, for example, if we hadn't identified some potential uh, priorities in the area of health uh, and medical. Um, I think there's a big question that many people are asking at the moment in the context of the COVID-19 crisis uh, about whether there are things that we can learn from the way that, that some things have been fast-tracked in the current crisis uh, about the potential to do things differently in this area in the future. Uh, but even beyond that, you know, there are massive game-changing uh, technologies uh, here, uh, in, again, linking back to uh, computer power, uh, you know, much more powerful computer processing, linking back to AI, big data and, and machine learning. So again, health and medical, definitely an area of interest. Um, space and scientific research, lots to, to look at there. And again, not just for its own sake, but because that is often uh, an, an early uh, adopter of technologies that then find their way back into the rest of uh, economy and society as well. Transport and mobility, a lot of the very interesting things uh, going on uh, there, but also potentially quite a crowded space. So, you know, lots already being done, for example, on autonomous vehicles. Uh, so one of these areas where I think we need to make sure that if we do get involved there, we are really adding value. Um, so, you know, that just gives you a bit of a snapshot in terms of uh, what we've been looking at in terms of potential priorities uh, for, for, for our uh, research. Um, but, you know, really remaining very, very keen to hear from you. Uh, so if you flick onto the last slide for me, Jack, um, thank you very much. Uh, this tells you how you can get involved. So hopefully we will make the slide, uh, Slido poll work and we'll hear a little bit more uh, from you guys uh, later on about what you're thinking we could look at. Um, but if inspiration strikes uh, beyond the bounds of this uh, presentation and this session, there are lots of ways uh, to get in touch with us. 
Uh, we have our Twitter handle. Uh, we have a website. Um, and you can even drop me a line uh, at catherine.ross at bt.com uh, if you want to hook up uh, afterwards. So thank you very much for listening and I hope we'll be in touch later on. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Gosh, um, that was really, really interesting. I, um, I, I can't help but think that this is the perfect time for something like the Regulatory Horizons Council. Um, as you just described, this is a, a, you know, a real meeting. Um, we have um, actually been able to this whole time see your poll um, and the poll results too. Um, I can't get them so you can see it. So it's almost <laughs> like a uh, mystery tour. The audience have been able to uh, put in what they think um, are, are the top five um, hot topics and I can read you some of them. So AI obviously came up top, uh, cryptocurrencies, distributed ledger technologies, um, but also things like uh, great use of ed tech, wearables, robotics, workplace automation, personalized drugs. And this is, you know, the list goes on and on. So we'll make sure that you have that as input to your exam question. Um, and also, um, I will definitely pick up some of the things in this list to ask you about as questions as we go through this panel. Um, but I wanted First, before we got into those the, the, the details, I wanted to introduce Simon uh, McDougall, who was, I told you is the um, Tech and Innovation Exec Director at the Information Commissioner's Office, standing in for Elizabeth Denham. Um, to start with, Simon, when you heard about the Regulatory, Regulatory Horizons Council, what were your first thoughts and um, what's your response been so far? Well, we're delighted that the Regulatory Horizons Council is, is, is doing this work because the, the timing is, is perfect. It's very hard for us as a, a day to day regulator to, to get our head up and contemplate uh, the future in the way that the RHC can do. You know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of mm. COVID issues, right now, as you'd imagine, contact tracing, immunity certificates, return to work, those kind of things. And uh, all the time, we're very conscious that the world is changing incredibly quickly. And we need this thought process to, to make sure we remain relevant. Uh, it's particularly uh, pressing for us, I think. I mean, Kathleen spoke about the, a, a holistic view and the need to bring together these challenges across different regulatory horizons. At the ICO, I think we're very conscious that the, the perimeters, the boundaries between different regulators are, are collapsing. Uh, and we have conversations around, say, privacy and competition, which we didn't really have a, 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 a couple of years ago. Um, we have conversations with Ofcom about online harms. Again, you know, these things cut across. And one of the key things I think there is that in the old days, we thought of data as a, as a trail we left behind. And people talk about your data exhaust and those kind of points. But now really data is the, the medium through which we're living our lives, you know, it's, it's, especially now through this conference and the like. It is everything. We all have a digital twin. Automated decisions have been made about us all the time. Uh, and, and as such, data regulation and everything else regulation uh, is converging. And one of the key things I think there, which which I took away from uh, Catherine's points, was if we're going to carry on being relevant as a regulator, both at the ICO and across the UK regulatory space, we need to make sure that we take regulation in a way which is good for government, good for society, good for the UK and good for people, because you don't have a healthy economy and a healthy society uh, unless you have trust. And, and trust is something which we're kind of short of right now, but we need to have the public having trust in how the information is, is being used. And if you have that trust then you can have successful innovation, people will try new things, try new organizations, try new ways of working, ways of thinking. So I think it's critical what the RHC is doing right now and, and we're really happy to be supporting it. I um I agree. I think um you you mentioned um the 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 fires that you're fighting in terms of the COVID response. What I what I'd like to do is if we we'll have a little bit of a conversation about the immediate um, regulations that we're looking at literally in the in the next year um, and already existing, and then we'll move on to, to looking at um, what's coming down the line, maybe in the next year, two years, and then I'd like of course, because of the theme of the conference, to look at the next 10 years. But starting with um, with uh, 
the current pandemic and the recovery. How how have you seen Simon the the work change from what you were doing uh, before to, to obviously the immunity passport return to work? What are the biggest challenges that you're facing right now? Well, we we have substantially restructured the ICO for for the the, the COVID phase. So we have uh, a dedicated team that is dealing with individual queries we've received from different organizations which has over 400 cases going through and that ranges from a local authority uh having questions around how it handles a vulnerable persons list all the way up to the nhsx contact tracing app so Mm. a a wide range and we've worked very hard at the ico to make sure that uh whilst uh, we're not uh softening on regulation in any particular way uh, we're making sure we balance the public interest against uh, the the rights and obligations uh, that 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 exist within GDPR and the like. Uh, so you know we, we know there's a, a a crisis going on, and we're working very hard to make sure that in areas such as data sharing across the NHS, uh, the the efforts of people to get individuals back to work, um, the efforts to actually make sure that the right people are, are shielded and looked after that the data is still being used in a uh, respectful way and in a compliant way, uh, but we're actually not getting in the way. The, the regulation is not the inhibitor here. I, I would say one okay. more thing, Tabitha, which is in our experience, GDPR is actually set up pretty well here. Um, it has a lot of stuff in the GDPR around uh, public interest, uh, vital interests, um, uh, areas of proportionality, risk management, regulatory forbearance and discretion from the regulator. So we haven't had to sit there and rewrite the regulations to make this happen it, it's it's still a pretty well but it's, it's a testing time and and every day we get uh new and challenging questions yeah i think um a huge res- i have huge respect for gdpr and and for you for 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 um ensuring that it's implemented catherine some people believe that gdpr isn't fit for purpose for some of um the current the current work that we're facing how can you and the Regulatory Horizons Council help with challenges when regulation isn't um, isn't the right, uh, it isn't doing enough? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And I, and I think in the first instance, a big part of our job is going to be to get under the skin of what is actually happening. So, you know, our, what what is it that market participants are actually trying to do? And what is their experience in trying to do it? And where are they experiencing difficulties? Uh, Because sometimes, and I think we touched on this earlier on, sometimes it's not necessarily the substance of the regulation. Sometimes it's the perception of it. Sometimes it's a misperception of it. Sometimes it's about how it's being applied, you know. So, you know, we've already got to get under the skin. We've got to have those really good quality conversations about what it is people are actually trying to do, what their experience is, and then try and unpack that. And I think we're fairly well placed to do that because, I mean, we're recruiting council members at the moment, but, you know, on the Regulatory Horizons Council, we'll have both people who have been at NARA, the cutting edge of, of technological developments. Some people who are perhaps more in that sort of reflective space, looking at you know num- a number of different technological developments or horizontal cross-cutting themes, and people who are sort of more expert in regulation. So I think we'll actually be quite well placed to unpick what's actually going on here and really get some targeted recommendations out of it. Yeah, there's a question online um, which links to this around what happens if we're only listening to those who can afford to engage in a privacy conversation? Um, do we risk having a you know digital underclass? Um, is that something that you'll be able to to help address, Catherine? I hope so. Yeah, I I, I really do. I mean, I, I would see it absolutely front and center of, of what the RHC is about that we need to go out and have conversations with people who are not the usual suspects, the people who do not have, you know, big, well-resourced public affairs teams and regulatory affairs teams. Um, you know, we'll need to talk to them as well, but we've, we've got to really walk around it. Uh, and we also have to not just talk to, you know, the people on the commercial side and the people in companies. We have to talk to the people involved in financing them. We have to talk to the NGOs. Uh, who are on the receiving end of, of some of this regulation, we've really got to walk around these issues from 360 mm. degrees. Yeah, and talking about the general public, I, you know, Simon, we've seen how stark the digital divide is. With the with the lockdown, I think it was no more clearer than, than how quickly some people were able to move online and others 
just weren't. Um, and and the, the inequality there was massive. Um, we also see a similar challenge, I think, when it comes to just the ability to understand um, and be explained any of this information. I think GDPR, um, although, and I've, I've said this both to Elizabeth and Catherine, although amazing, I worry that we didn't really explain very well to the general public how GDPR worked for them. Most people who understand GDPR think of it as um, something that they had to deal with at work, maybe, mm -hmm. um, but not that there were benefits in it for them as an individual. How how can you see addressing that going forward with any changes to GDPR that will need to be made? Well, I, I think if you have regulators trying to actually use the acronym GDPR to the general public, then you've already lost uh, half the debate. Uh, yeah. If you, if you dig into individual experiences, then very often they articulate challenges which speak very squarely to what we would recognise as issues around GDPR um, and data protection. The discussions around uh, fairness and proportionality, transparency, but people don't talk about it in terms of, of regulation and principles. You know, if you ask yeah. people whether they, you know, they, they want to know if an organisation knows something about them, they want to know that if a decision is being made about them, that it's it's fair and that they can object to it if, if, if need be. That you can, you can boil these things down to, to very simple experiences. Uh, and, and unfortunately, sometimes, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and as a regulator, absolutely guilty as charged, you can get talking about, you know, the letter of the law and regulation uh, when the experiences, you know, when the experiences talk for themselves. Uh, and and yeah, yeah, I completely agree that, that COVID has accelerated that because it has stripped bare how reliant we are on, uh, on different technologies. Uh, and and how actually uh, you know the, the the diversity of our society means that uh, some people don't have access to technology and some people have access to technology that don't understand it and we've got to really make sure we capture that uh, that range of experience um, in the work that we do and 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 Kathy, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine also with yourself at the RHC. Yeah. And and thinking thinking a little bit further forward and and looking at the next um, the next general election and and obviously we had huge challenges with the last election in terms of political campaigning and regulation there. Um, Catherine Simon, let's start with let's start with Simon. What what would you like to see? Um, what would you like to see change? And then Catherine, let's talk a little bit about how you can help us see some of those changes. Obviously, Simon, you were right in the middle of the Cambridge Analytica investigations. I asked for one of those SWAT jackets, and I didn't actually get an I see a jacket. But um, tell me, where where's your thinking coming out of how we can tackle the next set of elections? I think well, we've done some more thinking on this, and 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 suggested uh, a, a new code around political campaigning and use of data there, which, which could be of use. Um, I, I do think it's something we have to invest time in now. Uh, we, we we don't obviously have very likely a general election coming up anytime soon, but this is exactly the time we need to be thinking about it. Yeah, I think what we found in terms of the recent uh, political activity we had, and then the recent election was. There wasn't enough time to get you know reforms in place beforehand so now we have this time it would be good to actually step back and say what are our concerns and they cover everything from the use of data during the campaign the use of data before the campaign by political parties and then there's other related concerns such as uh disinformation and security on election day those kind of things we would all interrelate so i i would love to see and it's very hard right now obviously given covid and we have, we have short-term concerns but i would love to see uh, a, a step back and say, okay, let's spend the next couple of years making sure that we really get this right. Mm. And, and Catherine, is this something that your team, I, I saw on your list, you've got many tasks ahead. Is this some, how, how, how has this been prioritised? Well, I mean, we're still doing our prioritisation exercise at the moment, so we haven't got a... a Can I push that one up the list? ...list of priorities, <laughs> so if people think that we should really be looking at this, we're, we're, we're all ears. I mean, I think in terms of the value that we can add uh, at the RHC, bearing in mind, for example, that, that, that people at the ICO are already looking at this, uh, you know, and, and, and doing a pretty good job on that. Um, I think what, where we would be more interested is, is not just to think about the next election and what can we do in the next sort of two, three years uh, in order to tee up, uh, you know, the best use of technology for the next election. But we'd be thinking sort of 10, maybe 15 years ahead um, and thinking about, well, where is technological innovation driving um, right. you know, engagement uh, and citizenship over that kind of time horizon? 
And then we'd be saying, well, OK, how do we need to think about the impact of that on regulation today? So, so I think we'd be looking to complement what people like the ICO are doing by taking a more long term view. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and talking about sort of complementing and, and long term, but also right right in front of us, Brexit obviously um, presents itself with huge challenges as well as I'm sure some opportunities. How um, how have you how have you seen the, the, your role in making sure that we uh, we can support the regulators with the challenges and look towards some of these um, these uh, these benefits? Yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely central uh, to, to our role, to, to, to be honest, on, on a number of levels. I mean, I think, you know, everybody is absolutely uh, seized uh, of, of the fact that, uh, you know, whatever your view uh, on Brexit, there are substantial opportunities for the UK uh, to forge its own path in terms of regulation. And it's absolutely incumbent on us uh, to get maximum value uh, out of that for, for the UK. And that very much aligns with what we're trying to do. It perhaps frees up some scope for us. Uh, to look at things uh, and look at doing things differently that we might not have been able to look at doing differently uh, otherwise and we absolutely have to do that but it's also i think very much uh, front and center uh, uh, of the government agenda i mean the the document that really uh, gave rise to the idea of the regulatory horizons council was this white paper uh, on uh, regulation and the fourth industrial revolution and that was very mm -hmm. much thinking about you know the direction the future direction uh, of, of the uk uh, economy and i think rightly identified that you know, technological innovation is something in which uh, we have great strengths in the UK. Uh, and I think if we can marry up the strengths that we have in technological innovation with the strengths that we also have um, in terms of regulation, uh, put those two things together and we could actually find it's really good for UK competitiveness in a post-Brexit world if we get it right. Yeah, we can, we can all but hope. And we, we've got two minutes left, so just one more word from each of you, and then we'll go over to the Q&A. So everybody who's watching um, who has a, 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 a ticket to the platform, please do think up some of your questions, and we'll answer the ones that have already been asked. Um, in, 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 in a sort of a dream dream world, what's the relationship like between uh, Simon, you, at, um, you and... Um, and big tech, uh, you know, we have we have seen so much innovation and COGEX is thousands of speakers across all of the different stages talking about all the things they'd want to be doing. How do we make sure that you're you're keeping pace? Um, you're keeping pace. How do you make sure you've also got teeth to what to what you're able to do? What, what's your dream scenario? Uh, one of the key things for us is, is that we keep working on our innovation agenda. It's, it's, it's not enough, given how fast things are changing, uh, just to, to wait to, be, to learn that, that, that the situation is changing, you have to adapt. So that's why we, we invest time working with innovators, um, whether that's startups, you know, large technology firms, VC firms, really understanding what's going on, because we can only actually have a chance of keeping up with this rate of change if we're actively working with innovators. So we have our sandbox, we have our, our regulators innovation hub, where we work with other regulators uh, on, on their challenges. And we have an active dialogue where we just go and try and talk to uh, many of the stakeholders that Catherine listed in her presentation as, as, as stakeholders. Completely agree with that wonderful slide. So that's how we stay alive to, to, to the, 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 the world that's changing and, and all the themes that, you, uh, that your uh, attendees listed yeah. in the Slido poll. Yeah. And Catherine, one last question from me. I think one of the biggest challenges that the world faces, as we've all discussed, is climate change. How, um, how do you think that the Regulatory Horizons Council can help from a regulation perspective when it comes to things like um, the Green New Deal? Yeah, it's, it's a really, really good point. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, when I was talking about how the UK gets best value out, out of uh, technological innovation, I was really at pains to stress that this is not just in a sort of a, a narrow, you know, financial productivity and competitiveness mm. sense. It is also in terms of environmental sustainability, because I, I completely agree with you. Um, and I think one of the things that, that we, I hope, will really be able to add value on is the fact that a lot of the technological innovations that will enable us better to deal with, with climate change are necessarily cross-sector. Um, in nature, and I, I used to work for, for the water regulator, um, and I, I've certainly seen some of this firsthand. Mm. And it's quite difficult for bodies that are focused sectorally to stand back and think about things that are actually changing the interactions mm. in the whole system, yeah. in, in, a, in not just in a cross-cutting way, but in a genuinely systemic way. 
Um, and I think that's something that we at the Regulatory Horizons Council are really well placed, if, if not necessarily to come up with the answer on our own in a vacuum, but at least to hold the ring on a conversation uh, about uh, and then come up with some well-crafted recommendations that inevitably won't just be uh, addressed at, at, at one uh, regulatory body. They will be systemic in their own nature. So I, I really, really hope we can add some value on that. Yeah, that's um, that, me too. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Charlie while we go and get ready for the Q&A and we'll see everybody there. Thank you both so much. See you in 30 seconds, I hope. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.